Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfieland. When I'm not poisoning that drink he recently sipped, I'm here at the Wolfieland Riff Viewing Movies. By the way, the antidote for that poison is fresh air and sunshine, but there ain't no way you're going outside. Anyway, 2022 is upon us, and defying my predictions, the world has it finally ended. I know, I'm extremely disappointed too, but we gotta move forward. And speaking of moving forward, let's continue the Hatchet series with Hatchet 3. It's been a few months since I reviewed the first and second Hatchet films, so if you haven't seen those videos or want to refresh your memory of Victor Crowley, the deformed killer swamp ghost's earlier adventures, click the card or the link in the description. We're moving on to Hatchet 3 now, released in 2013, the concluding chapter of the original Hatchet trilogy. Third time's the charm, right? I wouldn't say that. The third film concludes the story that Adam Green began in 2006, so naturally he didn't direct this film. No, no, Adam Green wrote Hatchet 3, produced Hatchet 3, had full creative control of Hatchet 3's final edit, and even made a cameo appearance in Hatchet 3, but for some reason he just didn't feel like directing it. Instead, Hatchet 3 was directed by the cameraman of the first two films, BJ McDonald. And it must have been hard being named BJ as a kid. Having kids on the playground constantly taunt you, saying that Trapper John was the better MASH character, but hey, BJ might not have been as cool as Trapper John, but BJ had heart and kept the show grounded when its future seemed uncertain. Anyway, let's riff you Hatchet 3. The third film begins with the second film's ending. Danielle Harris is Mary Beth Dunstan busting a cap in Victor Crowley's ass. No, wait, that's Victor Crowley's face. Well, he looks like ass. Mary Beth has certainly beaten Victor, so she can safely put his totally dead corpse outside her peripheral view. What the? Now that Mary Beth has exterminated the ghost haunting this swamp, she can get started on its deforestation. What the? Oh, God damn it! How can Crowley even see her? His eyes are just gristle. In defense, Mary Beth gives Crowley a face full of her fist. Literally! But more importantly, Crowley lands on the chainsaw, and what remains of his genitals become just a fond memory. Well, I guess he won't need to get that vasectomy now. <laughs> Crowley's scalp and shotgun in hand, Mary Beth takes a two-minute walk back to civilization, if you can really call anywhere near New Orleans civilization. At the police station, we see series creator Adam Green's arrest. Should've gone on a swamp tour. Which isn't just a cute cameo. He actually got arrested for selling weed to some kids at the park. Mary Beth arrives at the station, and her covered in blood and brandishing a firearm doesn't get the standing ovation she had in her head walking down here. I killed him. There's your confession, it's an open and shut case. Ah, what is with these horror films and their obligatory shower scenes? Eh, maybe if we're lucky, this sequel will turn into one of those softcore women's prison movies. Any injuries? No, nothing noticeable, sir. Much like Zach Galligan's agent, I forgot all about him. Yeah, Billy from Gremlins plays the sheriff in this film, Sheriff Fowler. You found out that your family was dead, but then the next night, you go back out into that same swamp. Who is convinced that Mary Beth is a murderer because her story recounting the events of the first two films is too idiotic to ever be taken seriously. That has to be the stupidest story and some of the most idiotic and contrived decision making I've ever heard. I know this seems like a moment playfully poking fun at the series, but that was actually Zach Galligan's unscripted assessment of Adam Green's writing. The truth hurts, Adam. I don't think you realize the kind of deep shit you're in, little girl. You know, I'm starting to see why it's been a while since we've seen Zach Galligan in something. Meanwhile, back at the swamp, and I don't mean Hawkeye's tent, the cops have already discovered just a fraction of Victor Crowley's corpse manufacturing operation, aka murders. I like to call it a corpse manufacturing operation. It works better on my taxes. Jesus, they don't have faces, Lewis. Wow, either that's a dead body or somebody really went to town on that grapefruit. Making me hungry. To make matters worse for the sheriff, he also gets a visit from his ex-wife Amanda, played by Caroline Williams from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Well, he must have married his hot teacher right after high school or something. Please let me on that scene. Let me cover this story. Get in line. Amanda is a blacklisted journalist who is obsessed with the Victor Crowley legend and insists on being involved with the sheriff's current proceedings, and Fowler finds even more journalists outside. What the? Is this movie a student production or something? So. Where's the suspect? Because I'm about to post her bail. With the sheriff gone, Amanda seeks to bail Mary Beth out of jail in order to prove the legend of Victor Crowley is true so she can write about it in the new book she's writing. Are those just squiggles? You can either help me prove Victor Crowley exists 
or you can wait for the lethal injection that's going to end your miserable life. If given the choice, though, between helping a blogger meet the invincible murderer she barely survived twice before, or facing a swift lethal injection for the murders pinned on her, Mary Beth opts for the lethal injection. Do it. It's a lot less painful. Plus, you get that final meal. Victor Crowley's not going to cook you up a plate of spaghetti before he decapitates you. I think more people would be willing to get murdered if they got a free spaghetti dinner out of it. I know I can help you. Meanwhile, back at the swamp, Hawkeye and Trapper, I mean the paramedics, arrive on the scene to collect all the gore left over from the last movie, including the top of an R.A. meal off head. That's quite the piece of horror memorabilia right there. Amongst the paramedics is the Hatchet franchise's one Asian guy, this time reincarnated as Andrew, a paramedic who is supposedly unrelated to the previous two brothers played by the same actor. We're not gonna be out here all night, are we? How the fuck do I know, Andrew? Were you scared or something? The resemblance between Andrew and the murdered Sean is brought up, though. So we're going on Asian male, head severed off. You look kind of like you, man. Oh, what? Because I'm Asian? I am now convinced that the reason this guy showed up as three separate characters in three separate films over the course of seven years was just to make a joke about all Asians looking alike. Well played! We all look the same, right? <laughs> It's hilarious. Thankfully, this hatchet film doesn't take long to bring Victor Crowley back into the picture, played by Kane Hodder of Jason Voorhees fame once again. Crowley is bagged and tagged, but the paramedics arrived way too early. Victor's still got a few more corpses left to give to the paramedics before he's tapping out, starting with tapping a defibrillator on this guy's head, a tomato soup dispensing defibrillator. I guess you could say this guy's mind is blown. You know, uh, because his head exploded. Whatever, the deputy fires upon Crowley, somehow missing the massive fucking head, but this just puts Victor at perfect hatchet-grabbing distance, and the killer turns the deputy's skull into a fleshy pistachio. Crowley also kills some other guys quickly who had no screen time before this. The best deaths in hatchet movies happen mostly off-screen, after all. You still think he's dead? I killed him. You did, but I know how. Amanda and Mary Beth overhear the brand new murders happening over Deputy Winslow's radio. So Amanda uses her Karen powers of persuasion, convincing the deputy to illegally release Mary Beth and take the two women, one of whom is a murder suspect in an active investigation forced to come along against her will, out in the middle of nowhere to perform some vague task that will beat Victor Crowley. Where am I gonna run? Locked up in the back of this fucking car. Will you please shut up? A lot of fucking time is spent in the movie with Amanda, Mary Beth, and the deputy just driving to places. They don't finally arrive at Victor's Swamp until the last 15 minutes of the movie. So the main heroine spends most of the runtime just sitting locked up in the back of a police car, waiting to face off against her nemesis again once enough of the runtime has been padded out. Asshole. Hey, I'm still an officer of the law, so watch him out. Essentially, Amanda reveals yet another alternative method to defeat Victor Crowley that will most certainly be the final way he's beaten. The only way to give the ghost of Victor Crowley peace is to finally give him what he wants. Victor needs to be reunited with his cane hotter dad, Thomas, in order for the curse of the swamp to be lifted. But the problem is that Thomas Crowley is dead. But that's not really a problem, though. All they need is the remains of Thomas, which they have to drive a while to obtain, so sit tight. Meanwhile, the film tries to offer something entertaining to tide us over since the main plot line is boring. Sheriff Galligan leads a group of officers preparing to storm the swamp in pursuit of Crowley, but his authority is called in the question twice in one day by a former Jason Voorhees actor. The attacker armed? Definitely, but we just don't know with what. I'll take it from here, Sheriff. In this case by Derek Mears, playing a gung-ho SWAT commander by the name of Haas. You will give one verbal warning, and then you will shoot the kill. Man, playing a cop in a Hatchet sequel has to be the worst consolation prize ever for not getting to play Jason again, but Derek has a good attitude about it. Sir? <sighs> Before the group heads out blindly into the woods, a member of the SWAT team from out of state reveals she's never heard of Victor Crowley. I'm sorry, I'm new here, just transferred from Arizona. Who's Victor Crowley? But thankfully, the recap is cut short. There was this little boy who was born deformed, and he, come on, let's go dip shit. It's just Jason Voorhees, but he had a dad, he died in a fire, and he doesn't wear a cool mask, but he's basically Jason Voorhees. That guy's such a fucking asshole. The cops head into the thick of the swamp. This section of the film isn't very eventful. Any opportunity to reveal details about the characters is thwarted. And I don't know. Let's just make a small talk, Sheriff. I really don't want to hear about your divorce. 
but I suppose some suspense is built up gradually to the eventual encounter with Crowley as the cops increasingly find more dead bodies. But they've been finding corpses all day. They should be used to this by now. We get it. Crowley killed a lot of people in the last two movies. Have him kill some more people already. I really don't need to see testicles hanging from a tree or in any other context except between my own legs, thanks. These are somebody's balls. Balls are not supposed to be hanging from trees, yet I'm finding myself looking at fucking balls, sir. It is revealed, though, that Andrew survived the massacre of the first response team by hiding inside somebody else's corpse like it was a tauntaun. I hid underneath someone else's body I found over there. And you didn't fight back. No, I didn't fight back. Yeah, what a coward, not fighting back against an invincible, undead killing machine. Andrew really is pathetic. I'd rather die an unnecessary, brutal, painful death like all these other dumb motherfuckers than live to be a coward. I hid, and that's the only reason those aren't my balls hanging from that tree. Despite Andrew's pleas for the group to all hide behind tiny bushes before the monster shows up like this is a Scooby-Doo episode, Hawes and the other cops decide to approach the home of the man who effortlessly murdered dozens of people in just a few nights. Two of the cops just standing in front of one of his shacks, strategically facing away from the door. Oh no, I can't believe that happened. Okay, we get it already, Victor. You're a big fan of Mortal Kombat. The squad demonstrates what their years of training and experience has taught them as they blindly shoot at the shack. Nothing in their line of sight, wasting all of their ammo in the process. I think it's safe to say that Victor Crowley has finally been beaten. Beaten this guy's ass, that is. <laughs> With all their ammo wasted, the cops join in for a loving tribute to Rodney King. Okay, I think Adam Green's been watching too much anime. The surviving cops put up a good fight, standing around, doing nothing as Crowley kills them off one by one, and after the shooting him strategy doesn't work again, Derek Mears decides to finally prove once and for all that he's tougher than Kane Hodder, but ends up turning into a freshly circumcised penis. This movie is like watching Mortal Kombat cutscenes and never actually getting to play the game. This hapless sap is next on the chopping block, but for some reason Crowley's suddenly struggling to kill this dude particularly, which conveniently provides enough time for one of the cops to whip out his standard issue rocket launcher. Usually they only use these for black guys. There's no way this can go wrong. Okay, well, at least that father of three died painlessly blown up by a co-worker he trusted. Woo! You see that? Now that's how you take a bitch out. This guy sounds like he's playing a Halo match on Xbox Live. Of course, the bitch was far from taken out, but Sheriff Galligan has a brilliant idea. Yeah, it doesn't work, jackass. You shot him like a hundred times already. So anyway, Crowley pulls the dude's arms off like he's an ant and drowns him in some mud. A surprisingly mild kill considering the guy blew up Victor's house. All right, let's get back to the boring main plot line of the film that you've already forgotten. Amanda retrieving the ashes of Victor Crowley's father from Victor Crowley's cousin, Abbott, who is played by none other than the late Sid Haig himself. It's the middle of the night, for Christ's sakes. It's 8.45. Well, that's what I said. And his whole character is that he finds different ways to be racist to Deputy Winslow. Who is the colored? Who's the... Deputy Winslow? Jefferson Parish? It, uh, really sucks that this is one of Sid Haig's final roles. And don't you try to steal nothing. I got eyes in the front of my head. It's a real waste of Sid Haig, too, because his one scene as this racist Mr. Magoo just amounts to Amanda taking Thomas Crowley's ashes at gunpoint and then leaving. That's all Sid Haig gets in the movie. I am a veteran. I went all the way to Korea. Fucking white people. A good writer would have set it up so maybe Abbott's condition for giving the ashes would be that he comes along with them, creating more conflict, and they could have done something with Abbott meeting his cousin Victor, go more into the Crowley family, but no, Sid Haig is just done in this movie. What a waste. That's right! Run, boy! <laughs> Pow! Yeah, gotcha! Back in the swamp, there was an extra paramedic that everyone forgot about, and the nameless character comes across the shaggy-looking guy from the first movie, still alive after spending three nights bleeding out of his neck. The Avatar sequels didn't pan out, but neither does his role in Hatchet 3. <laughs> You're gonna be fucking kidding me. Between being killed by either Victor Crowley or stock footage of an alligator, this guy chooses alligator stock footage. 
Okay, this movie is definitely running out of money, which means the movie is almost over. Sheriff Galligan, Andrew, and Adam Green's wife get quartered inside the water ambulance, but the guy outside has a belt sander and a lot of patience. Victor's gotta make sure he's got plenty of room to fit through this homemade door and kill these assholes, but Crowley is distracted by the sound of Amanda's arrival at the swamp. Does he have the vocal cords of a bear? Literally five seconds after Victor seems to leave, the sheriff sticks his head through the belt sander hole to see if it's belt sander free. <laughs> nope, there's still a belt sander around. Okay, yeah, this movie is definitely running out of money. They're gonna just start throwing Halloween decorations from Party City at us next. <laughs> Adam Green's wife makes a grab for the gun in front of the hole a guy just got decapitated in, and big surprise, this happens. <laughs> Bitch, just stay away from the murder hole and you'll be fine. Yeah, I knew it, they're throwing Halloween decorations at us now. Amanda finally attracts Crowley's attention in order to execute her genius plan. Make Mary Beth hand Crowley his father's ashes and he'll, like, stop killing people, I guess. Or be reminded that his father died and go into a violent rage. Either one, I suppose. Even Crowley looks at these people like he can't believe the stupidity of what's happening in front of him. Daddy. We've had some bad Friday the 13th sequels, but at least we never had to hear Jason say mommy. Mommy? No, wait, we did. And it was Kane Hodder too. Never mind. <laughs> you know, this guy shoots Crowley dozens of times, but not once does he ever try to shoot him in the head. It at least stuns him for a little bit. He's dead. Oh, okay. Since you said so, the movie is over. But not really. Unfortunately, Deputy Winslow's shirt was the only thing keeping his vital organs from flying out. Amanda makes a move for the empty gun, but is forced to beg for her life. I came to save you. Now you'd think Victor would be more grateful. She came here to save him after all. Oh, headbutting somebody with a severed head. That's a power move. Anyway, Victor impales Mary Beth on a tree, which he probably should have been able to do sooner, but Mary Beth's not gonna die without reuniting a father with his son. How heartwarming. Here's Daddy, motherfucker! So, yeah, Victor melts into a chewed-up Snickers bar after touching his dad's ashes, which is ultra lame, so Mary Beth uses the last of her strength to turn what's left of Crowley into a red Christmas tree. So, this is what Adam Green thought would be a climactic conclusion to this trilogy? No wonder he didn't direct this one. Good news, though, everyone! Andrew survived! Oh, thank God Andrew made it to the end of this trilogy! He is my favorite character, after all. Oh, just fucking bleed out already, Mary Beth. You've been replaced by Andrew now, bitch. <gasps> Well, Hatchet 3 is easily the worst of the trilogy. It just feels like it's stretching thin what was left hanging in the second film. Trying to wring out some plot out of yet another method to vanquish Victor Crowley while another group of heavily armed men head into the swamp, but the main plot of obtaining the ashes takes way too damn long, and it does a disservice to the main heroine of the series to just have her sitting in the back of a car handcuffed, forcing her against her will to carry out some stupid plan, and then having her go out like a punk without being able to put up a fight after three films. I give Hatchet 3 a melted cane hotter out of a cane hotter urn. I'm not done with the Hatchet series though. There's still one more left, Victor Crowley. Get subscribed so you don't miss that riff view. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VI IP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.